So I was both glad and sad at the same time. Not because of that. More sad. But I, I couldn't believe I got to stand here. I couldn't believe I got to, to walk here. I couldn't believe I got to reminisce here. I was like, Marsha, Marsha, come over here. Let me show you this. And I drug her around the yard where I grew up as a kid. And I showed her like every tree, every bush had a story. Like, Marsha, look at this. See this bush? We used to hide behind this during release of Belgium. It is hands down the best hiding place in the whole yard. And see that tree over there? I climbed that tree from the bottom to the top when I was six months old. <laughs> Which is a lie because I didn't move there until I was four. But it sounded good. You know, she's like, whoa. You know, and then I took her to this other, these bushes, these tall yew trees by the corner of our house. I said, stand back here with me and look through the, through the gap. And you see that house, like 75 yards away is a back porch. That's Jamie's back porch. And one day, Jamie and I hid right here and we watched his big brother, Billy, take a whooping from his dad on the back porch with a belt. Oh, best day of the summer. It was so good, you know. And, and then I, I took her right into the front yard and I said, and this, this is where Jamie and I landed. And she's like, what do you mean landed? I said, this is where we learned to ride our bikes. See, our yard was about three acres, and it was uh, from the backyard to the front, which is a little bit of a downhill, all grassy. So it was this beautiful place to learn to ride without, it, without training wheels. And when the day was right, Jamie and I went out there to learn to ride our bikes, and our, our dads went out with us, our moms went out. And, and our moms went about halfway between the back and the front yard. His mom's a nurse. She's like an ambulance, like waiting for us to wreck right there. And, and, but our dads went up to the top of our backyard with us and Jamie's going first so Jamie gets on his bike and he holds his handlebars as tight as he can and his dad just like whoosh, pedal and and Jamie goes bouncing down the yard he bounces over the sidewalk goes just barely misses the giant lilac bush around the forsythia and out around in the front of the house and I never saw him again <laughs> not really but um so then it was my turn right and and my dad says you ready I said I'm ready and I'm holding my handlebars and she pushes me down through the grass, and I'm pedaling like mad, and I, I bump over the sidewalk, and I just miss the giant lilac bush. I go right around the first safety bush in the front of the yard, and I landed right where Jamie landed. Like, we both wrecked in the exact same place, and we're both laying there. Our wheels are still spinning, and our, our, we're laying there on the ground, super wrecked, but super excited because we just learned to ride our bikes, <laughs> sort of, right? We learned how to crash land, which is important because we did that a lot as kids. Then I took Marsha to, to up, up to the backyard, and I said, and this, this is where I learned to play ball. Every day, spring, summer, and fall, baseball, wiffle ball, football, kickball, mostly baseball. Just ball, ball, ball every single day. And I took her over to the bases. Like this, this was home plate. And, and back in the day, they were just solid like dirt, like concrete, packed down bases this big because they were used so often. My dad hated bowing the grass back there because it is it's big indents, oh, solid dirt. And I said, this, is, this was home plate. I took her to first place. I said, this, this was first base. I took her to second. I said, this is second base. By the time I got to third, she said, Rich, I bet this is third base. I said, yeah. But it was so cool because even though 40 years had gone by, and it was overgrown with grass, the indents were still there. I almost wept. I, just, I stood in my backyard. And I just, it was like Jamie and I were kids playing 40 years ago. There's something great about reminiscing, isn't there? And yet, I, was, I realized something that day. When I was standing in that old backyard, something more powerful than reminiscing was going on. I was grieving friendship. Not grieving that I had friends back then, but grieving that I don't have as many friends now. Guys, let me talk to guys for a second. Put your, put your ears on men. I talk to a lot of you, and it never fails. The more men I talk to, the more I hear over and over again the lament, I don't have any friends. I talk to guys all the time who tell me, I, one guy in particular, he said, my best friend and I, and he stopped. He said, wait a minute. My best friend is actually just this guy that I work with. I don't do anything else besides that. And that was his best friend. Guys, we're not good at making friends or, or hanging out with friends. I um, mean, we fake it, but that's one of the biggest needs. I just, an aside, I hear that among guys a lot. So we're just in week number two of our sermon series called Tagged. It's all about relationships. And we're, we're reminding you that every relationship in your life matters. And it's just like when you were a kid, when you were a kid in your backyard and you played tag, you would run around and, and you would touch all these other lives, all these other lives would touch or tag you, right? That's not changed. You touch tons of lives, tons of lives touch you every day, even as an adult. 
And, and when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're at school, when you're, when you're uh, out fishing, where we, we wish some of us were today, right, trout fishing, wherever you are, you are constantly touching other lives. They're touching you. Relationships. And every single one of those relationships matters. And you want to know something? You are built for this. You are, you are made for this. And how, how do I know? We can go back into the Bible. I'll show you. And I know, I know that some of you, when I, the moment I say we're going to the Bible, you're like, I, I don't believe that. That's okay. Let me just repeat to you today what I told everybody who was here last week. We want to give you permission not to agree with everything we say. If the Bible is not a source for you right now, that's okay. Um, we're going to use it as our source. But what I do believe, even if you don't agree with the source, um, what we're going to dig out of it and mine out of it is so good that it's not only good in here, but it's good out there. So we want to give you permission just to take whatever you want from this today and apply it to your life. You don't have to believe like we believe. You don't have to agree where we got it. But the principles you're going to learn are going to be right on, spot on for the way you live with people um, in, in your life. So let me go take you back to the Bible to prove to you, I believe, um, that you were built for relationship. Um, remember, go back to the very beginning when God created. Like day one, God created, it was good. Day two, God created, it was good. God created, it was good. God created, it was good. There's this pattern, God created, it was good. But there's one place in all of creation where God said it's not good. God created, I believe, God created the first man, Adam. I believe he created him out of the dust of the earth. I believe he breathed his breath of life into him. He formed him, then he picked him up and he plopped him down in the Garden of Eden. And he said, uh, you are now going to take care of this. You, you take care of the garden, you tend the garden. And he, and he put Adam in charge of the whole garden. And he stepped back and he watched Adam tend the garden. And I don't know what it was, guys. I'm not, I don't want to throw us under the bus. But I think God looked at him and said, dude needs a helper. I, I don't know, but what he actually said was, it is not good for man to be alone, right? God recognized right away, hey, this guy needs someone. I don't know, maybe it was in the naming of the animals. Guys, I don't know, who came up with the word aardvark? Like, who, who came up with a name like hippopotamus? Last time I checked, a seahorse is not a horse. Thank you, Adam. Last time I checked, a prairie dog is not a dog, right? I think God would scratch his head saying, this guy needs help. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. Bottom line, you... This goes way beyond finding your true love. For those of you under 25, beyond finding your bae. But the reality is, there's a principle about relationship here, and it simply is this. God is a relational God. And because you are made in his image, you're made to be relational too. So for these seven weeks, we're talking about the relationships in your life. Last week, we looked at the largest group of people that you're in relationship with, um, they don't run deep, but they run wide, these relationships with strangers. And we said there are three ways um, that you need to learn how to treat strangers. Number one, every life matters, like every single one. When you see someone, no matter who they are in your daily life, they matter. Number two, we, we discussed the fact that if, if they need help, you're not too important to help them. And number three, we said when you do stop to help them, it will always cause you sacrifice. You have to, it will cost you something. And whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, those are just three truths about how everybody ought to treat strangers, right? So hopefully that's helpful for you. But today we're going to bring it in a little bit closer to home, and we're going to talk about another big group of people in your life, and that is friends. Some of you may be thinking, you know, I don't need help with friends. I, I, I make friends easily. I have 13,000 friends on my Instagram right now. Woo, good for you. Hey, can I tell you screens are different than reality, and making friends is different than maintaining friends. Um, and you, you will have to eventually deal with people in real life, face-to-face, -face, um, not Facebook, um, at some time in your life. And so we want to talk about friends. And some of you are thinking, I, I don't have any friends. I'm not good at keeping friends. Nobody calls me to do anything. I, this is going to be good for you. I'm going to remind you that we're talking today not about quantity, but about quality. So today we're going to talk about uh, friends and, 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 and friendships. And what we're going to do, I'm going to introduce to you today five principles of friendships. Five principles of friendship. Everybody grab, grab the, the sermon notes out of your bulletin. You're actually doing it. It's upstairs I had to say, no, seriously, grab your sermon notes. Uh, but y'all are bending down finding it. Listen, there are going to be um, notes on there for you, some blanks for you to fill in. If, if you take these and you begin to apply these in your life, every friendship in your life is going to get stronger and deeper and better than it's ever been. I, I believe that because this all comes from God's word. Um, now, if, if you know me, if you're here with us normally, you know that I like to take a passage of Scripture and just absolutely break it up and just mine out of it the truth of God from a passage. We're not doing that today. 
When I, when I give you each of these five principles, each one of these comes from a singular verse in Scripture. So we're going to be bouncing around to different verses in Scripture. I, I want you to be able to follow along. So we kind of give you a cheat sheet today on your sermon notes you're looking at. There are actually um, the, the passages of Scripture written down for you. We also want you to, to begin bringing your Bibles. Um, if you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you a Bible. Like if you need a Bible today, we got a whole rack of them. They're just free. Take a Bible with you. Anybody want a Bible right now, by the way? If you don't have a Bible, you want a Bible right now, we'll bring it to you. Just raise your hand. Come on, I want to see somebody act as a stewardess. No, no one? Okay, if you need a Bible, grab it on your way out. Or better yet, you know, just, boy, just grab it on your phone. Grab a Bible app. I, I use YouVersion. Um, I think it's fantastic. Find a way to have the Bible with you on your phone. It's easy to do. Um, but if, if, you've got, if you've got a paperback, you're a bound Bible, um, just open up to the middle. We're going to be in Proverbs for three of our five principles. And if you open up right to the middle, you'll be close to Proverbs. If there's a name of a dude on the top of your page, it's probably a prophet. Go back to the left um, a couple books. Go backwards. You'll find Proverbs. If you open your Bible to the middle and it says Psalms, okay? It's really called Psalms, but it says Psalms on the top. Just go to the right one book and you'll find Proverbs. And that's where we want you to be. Proverbs for three of our five um, principles um, this morning. Uh, so here we go. Five principles of relationship. Here's number one. Principle number one is the principle of love. All you need is love, right? Wrong. Um, great song, but it, it, you need more. It's a great place to start, but there's more to it than that. Um, and again, we're going to turn back into the Bible um, because I want you to see what a man named Solomon wrote. Now understand, Solomon was gifted by God to be the wisest man to ever walk the face of this earth. Wisest man in the world ever. Understand also, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had a thousand women telling him every day what to do and how to do it. Right? As men were like, honey, you can tell me what to do or how to do it, but not both, or you just do it yourself. Right? He had a thousand women speaking every day. I'm not sure that Solomon actually used the wisdom God gave him all the time, but he did learn a thing or two about relationships. So here's the first thing I want you to understand. Uh, the principle of love, in Proverbs 17, 17, Solomon wrote this. He said, a friend loves at all times. Not just the good times, but also in the hard times. I cannot overemphasize the importance of this one line for the friendships you have in your life. One day down in, in South Georgia, when we were pastoring a church down there. Marsh and I got a knock on our door 9 to 10 o'clock at night, and uh, you know, what wasn't odd, you know, it happened once in a while, but we went to the side door, opened it up, and, and there's a, a young couple who are friends of ours. They were in college, in a college town, just the next town over. They'd been coming to our church. We had known them previously. They were friends, but they were also kind of, we were kind of mentoring this younger couple, married couple, and we knew immediately that something was wrong with them, and so we invited them in. They sat down, and the husband wasted no time. He looked directly at me, and he said, Rich, I cheated on my wife. And she's just this little bit of a thing. She's sitting beside him, just tears streaming down her, her face. I said, when did this happen? He said, about five hours ago. And he just caved, and he kissed a woman who was not his wife. As soon as it happened, he walked home to the apartment where they lived on on campus, told her. She immediately got in a, uh, uh, what's the thing you carry clothes in? Suitcase. Yeah, got a suitcase, sorry. Um, <laughs> threw all of her clothes in it. She's, just, she's ready to, to bail out, right? But before she bailed, they wanted to talk to us. So they come over, they're standing on our porch, now they're sitting on our couch. And he did not need me to tell him he was wrong. He was wrong. He did not need me to tell him, hey man, you better repent. He'd been repenting from the second it happened. You know what he needed from us? He needed us to love him, period. We were mad, I was mad, because she was our friend and you, you just cheated on her. But he needed us to love him. She needed us to love her. They needed us to love them. And so we did that. That night, the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year. And now, 25, 30 years later, they are married. He's a pastor. They have like 300 kids. Hey, that's what God does, right? When you take God's word seriously and you live out what God's word says, he saves marriages, he, he blesses families, and he takes people into places they never thought they would really be. How good is God? But that one statement, I cannot, cannot emphasize enough the principle of love. A friend loves at all times. Here's principle number two, the principle of forgiveness. Listen, if, if love is the most important ingredient to your friendships, forgiveness runs a close second. I don't care who you are or what friends you have. 
They will hurt you. They will disappoint you. They will frustrate you. Some of them will betray you. And unless you are unable, if you are unable or unwilling to forgive them, then you run the risk of losing them as a friend for the rest of your lives. Again, here's what that really, really wise man named Solomon said. Proverbs 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. In other words, when a friend, when your friend hurts you, you have two choices. You can go to that friend and you can say, listen, what you did didn't work. What you did hurt me. And we need to work through this. We need to work on this. You can be mad. You, you can be loud. You, you, you can be accusing, whatever it is. But when the, the two of you decide to, to hash it out together, you're working towards love. You're getting back into relationship together. But the second half of, of what, what he says, whoever repeats a matter separates close friends. If you say, you know what? I don't want to forgive you. I'm going to remind you over and over again how bad you hurt me. In fact, I'm going to do more. I'm going to invite other people to know how bad you hurt me. I'm going to blab about it to all the friends that we've shared so they know how bad you are. That's when you begin to separate friendship. You have two choices. If you choose the first one, you'll probably get to re-engage and have that person as a friend. If you don't, if you choose the second one, you probably won't have them as a friend anymore. That is the principle of forgiveness. Number three, the principle of boundaries. One reason your friends are your friends is because they speak into your life in meaningful ways. Um, you have two groups of friends in your life. You have your friends who follow Jesus, and you have friends who don't. And you need both of those sets of friends. If you don't have any friends who are not following Jesus, broaden your circle of friendship. If you don't have any friends who are following Jesus, we want to be your friend. We want to walk with you and talk with you about who Jesus is. So you need to have both of those. You need to love both of them equally. You need to, to enjoy both of them but you also need to understand the boundaries that you set on those two groups of friends. Here, here's what I mean by this. When it's important stuff happening in your life, you need to trust that the people who are speaking into your life have God's heart in their hearts. When, 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 you're, when you're talking about not, not, really great important, not really important things, it's okay to listen to what other people might say who aren't following Jesus. Here's how, here's how, again, Solomon wrote this um, in the principle of boundaries. This is Proverbs 27, 9. He said, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. In that culture, these people were, were, they were um, farmers. They were shepherds. They were working outside, and, and a person could be maybe out with a sheep for a week or a month or two months or more at a time. They didn't take showers every day, week, or month. They stunk. They were dirty. Do you understand how great perfume and oil would be to those people? Man, you put that on, you make everybody's heart around you glad, right? You just feel clean and everybody doesn't smell you. You, just, you look, appear clean. In the same way, the sweetness of a friend comes as earnest counsel. When you're, when you're talking about what, what outfit to wear, what, where to go for dinner, what, where to go play golf, stuff like that, take anybody's advice you want. But when it comes to life direction, I'm going to encourage you to choose the friends who have God's heart in their heart. Because they're going to give you, and, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. I'm just saying we look at the world differently. We do. And I'm encouraging people who follow Jesus to get advice from people who follow Jesus when it comes to life direction and life decision. That is the principle of boundaries. Set those boundaries well in your life. Now, those first three principles, those are friend builders. The last two we're going to talk about are or could be friend killers. So here we go. Here's principle number four, the principle of comparison. And this is where social media can really come into play because it makes this so easy to happen. Let's just say that, that you get a new truck. And, and you're wild about your new truck. You love, it's not really new, but it's new for you. It's nice, it's new. You get your truck and you wash that truck and you wax that truck and it looks so good. You're taking all your selfies with your truck and you're po posting all those pictures of you and your truck on your, on your Instagram um, story and you're hoping all your friends are looking at it. But while you're looking at that, you're also going to look at your other friends' posts and daggum, Dave got a new truck. And Dave's new truck is a new truck. It looks good. It is a blacked out piece of Chevy eye candy, right? And it is, it's a winner and everybody knows it. And you're looking at his truck 
comparing it to your truck, and all of a sudden, you don't feel so good about your truck anymore. You don't feel so good about you anymore. In fact, you don't feel so good about Dave anymore because the reality is you got stuck in a comparison trap. Don't do that. You don't need to compare what you have with anyone else. The comparison trap takes you from glad to sad, even to mad, really fast. So here's what God, because he knows us so well, here's what God says about comparison. He said, you shall not covet. Just one of those fancy Bible words for be jealous or compare. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not covet Dave's new truck. God knew. It's not really in there, right? But that's what we do. It's okay to look at your, at your neighbor's stuff and appreciate it. It's even okay to say, Dave, way to go. We love your new truck. But when you begin to play the comparison game, it will begin to challenge your friendship because comparison leads to envy. Envy turns into frustration. Frustration moves into anger, and anger leads to hurt. I heard a great line about this the other day. Let me share this with you. This guy said, the moment you begin to look at what your friends have, you stop looking at what God has given you. Isn't that great? The moment you begin looking at what your friends have, you stop looking at what God has given you. Don't play the comparison game because nobody wins. Hey, principle number five, let's go through this one. This is the principle of approval. And this one's going to run just a little bit deeper. Um, I was listening to a guy I'd never heard before. His name is Pastor Trent Shoemake, and he had some really great things to say about approval, so I grabbed him and made them fit into this sermon. Um, it's just good stuff I can't wait to share. Again, social media is really, really good. Um, because we can keep pace with our, our friends' lives, right? We can watch what their kids are doing, or our grandkids are doing. We, we, we can keep pace with where they are in life. And did you ever, you ever get frustrated when, when you're following your friends' posts? Like they post a picture of their family, and they're perfect. Did that ever frustrate you? About four years ago, we traveled out west um, with, with our best friends to visit our other best friends out in Colorado. So we loaded up on our minivans, and we followed them and about three million miles like, to get out there. And all along the way, we're taking pictures everywhere, family picture, family picture, family picture, all these great places. And one night, I was looking at their pictures versus our pictures. Wow, that's a beautiful family. They, I mean, they're, they're a beautiful family, husband, wife, daughter, son. They're, they're a beautiful family, and dang, they match. Like, like there was coordinated. All their clothes were coordinated in every single. Was that strategic? Yeah, it was on purpose, right? That was amazing. And I looked at our picture like, we're like this. Like, like don't get me wrong. I, I married the most beautiful woman in the world. We made some pretty beautiful babies, right? But we didn't match. I'm wearing purple. She's wearing green. He, she's wearing pink. He's wearing orange, you know? Like, wow. Does that ever bug you when you look at your friend's pictures and they're like, what a perfect family. Like you're looking at their story on Instagram and, and they've got all their family and they're all looking at the camera at the same time and smiling. Even the dog like is smiling at the camera. That doesn't happen to me. Like the other day I was at Easter morning, I was taking a picture for a family and it's a beautiful family. And I, I got their cell phone as kids and mom and dad and grandparents. And it's a beautiful picture until I took the picture. The moment I hit the button, one of the kids like, right, uh, let's try it again. I could take another picture. Another kid's like, and I thought, oh, it, let's just keep going. I'll, I'll keep snapping. It got worse. They started crying, right? None of those are being posted anywhere online. Can I just remind you that when you look at the perfect family on, on, on all those posts, that was probably accidental, you know, or it was like the 100th shot of 100 shots. Um, that's not reality. Here's the thing about social media. It's a great place for you to hide. We like to put on social media um, the presentation of, of us that we wish we were. We, 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 we want to see, hey, if this is the me I want others to see, but that's not always the real you. Um, not many of those perfect pictures were on purpose, and, but that's what we do. Uh, for instance, if it's a bad hair day, you're not taking selfies and posting those, right? But on a good hair day, you're using filters, you're getting angles, you're making duck lips. Oh, girls, can we just not do that? Please. Y'all know what duck lips are? Please, yeah, thank you. No more duck lips that are hideous. But on a good hair day, you're click, 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 click. And then what are you doing? You're posting, and posting. And you're putting them on Instagram. You're putting them on, you know, if you're older than 50, you're putting them on Facebook. But you're putting them everywhere. And then what do you do? You wait, right? You're waiting. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for likes, right? You're wait Better yet, you're waiting for some loves. You know, I get even deeper than likes. But if you get enough likes, you're like, woo, good day for me. Good hair day and good like day. But if you're waiting and you're not getting any likes, 
You're like, well, well, maybe I'm not as pretty as I used to be. Maybe I'm not as pretty as I think I am. Maybe my guns aren't as big as Dave's, so I don't know. The reality is, what you're looking for is approval. And you're waiting for approval. And here's the the danger of that. Again, using selfies as an example. You take your selfie and you don't get enough likes. You know what the temptation is? Well, my boyfriend's not approving that. Maybe I'll take some pictures of other parts of my body. Hey, teenage girls, don't do that. You're looking for something that guy doesn't need to give you. You do, you do not need the approval of your friends. Remember, a friend loves you at all times, good hair days and bad hair days. You do not need the approval of someone else. The only approval you need is the approval of Jesus Christ. The approval of your friends may change your outfit, but it will never change your life. Deep down, even if you don't realize it, there's one approval you are looking for, you're waiting for. That is God's approval. Some of you are trying to squeeze approval like that out of your friends. And here, here's, here's what Pastor Trent said. I love this line. It's what I pulled in. He said, you cannot expect your friends to give you the approval that only God can give you. You will crush them under the expectation of that. Stop expecting your friends, whatever age you are, to give you the approval that only God can give you. There you go. Five principles of friendship. So here's what you do with those. Number one, just love your friends at all times. Number two, forgive, forgive your friends in the hard times. Number three, enjoy your Christian and non-Christian friends, but set boundaries to how and when they speak into your life. Number four, don't compare what you have to what other your friends have. And number five, get your approval from Jesus, not from your friends. Let's take home. Here, here's one other thing I'm going to challenge you to do this week. All through Lent, well, actually one week during Lent, I asked us all to set an alarm on our phones or your watches, whatever you use for an alarm. And at 1.14 every day, we were praying for the church. Like, I loved it. I heard alarms going off in restaurants and places. Right, It was great. Then I challenged you, why not just do it all season long, all Lent? And so we did all Lent long. I don't know about y'all. I, I, mine, mine's still set. I keep doing it. I encourage you to keep doing that. But even if you stopped, let me challenge you this week. Reset that alarm for 1.14. And this week, when it goes off, every day, pray for a friend. Every day. Lift up a name of a friend of yours that you know needs you to be praying for them. It might be the same friend every day. You might be crying out to God saying, God, you know what his needs are. God, you know what her needs are. Pray for that friend all week long. Maybe it's a different friend every day. Just make a list. Say, Monday's this person. Tuesday's this person. Maybe even let them know you're praying for them. So they, they say, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going through a hard time right now with this. I'll pray for you. You're Thursday, so I'll pray for you on, the, on Thursday. Pray for a friend at 1.14. I cannot wait to see what God does when 800 people pray for a friend every day for a whole week. Pray with me right now. God, thank you for being a God that cares about these things. And Jesus, I I pray right now that before we even start praying for our friends, that you would be opening their hearts to you. God, I can't wait to hear testimonies how during this one week, whether they knew it or not, you were working in their lives and they, they found you, they discovered you, they, they heard you, they saw you, maybe for the first time, all because people in this church family were praying for our friends. Our friends came to know you as Savior and Lord Jesus. Or Lord God, I can't wait to hear about testimonies, how they come back and say, man, I'm, I love Jesus, but I was going through a hard time and my friend was praying for me and it got me through. God, I believe you're going to do amazing things in one week because you're calling us to pray for our friends. And God, it's not just what you said. We can watch what you did. This is how you loved us. You even called us friends. So may we be friends in the same way to the people you put in our lives. God, we commit this to you and pray this Jesus in your holy name. Amen. Hey, so here's what's going to happen. The worship team is going to bring a song out over you. And this is a time for you to really reflect on what you heard. Maybe you want to come to the altar, start praying for a friend now. Maybe say, God, show me who I need to pray for. This is a time for you to be able to do that. This is a time for you to remain seated. We can come to the altar, whatever is comfortable for you. But use this time to let God begin working on your heart about the friends that are in your life. While we're doing this, the the welcome teams will come come around at the same time um, with baskets for the offering during this song.